Chapter 6 Saturday, June 20, SUP, TH, slash SUP, 1852 Walking is much harder work than I'd imagined it would be. The women walk all day long and then have to cook supper and clean up after it. The men find this journey an adventure, but for the women, it's just working harder than ever before. I look forward to opening a business because it will feel like a rest after the work of the trail. I told Joseph the truth about my past at the dance tonight, and he told me what he's been hiding as well. I feel as if my story is so much worse than his, and I wait to find out if he can accept me for who I am, or if he wants me to part from him and Emily when we reach Oregon City. We talked about the possibility of a real courtship and marriage tonight, which is why I felt the need to tell him the truth about what I did. I'm not sure it's something he'll be able to forgive, but we've agreed to have a long walk and discuss it tomorrow. I do hope things can work out between us. I cannot imagine my life without little Emily. She brings joy to everyone she comes into contact with. By that Saturday, Trudy's legs were so sore, she was sure she'd never be able to walk another inch. Of course, the soreness in her arms was finally getting better. Driving the oxen was just as difficult as walking all day. They were now far from the river they'd followed for so long, and it felt as if they were in a different land entirely. The nights were quite cool, and the days were hot, but it was a dry heat. Trudy had to keep reminding herself that every step she took was one step closer to Oregon. At the dance, she was careful to say little to Joseph except about Emily. Talking about his daughter always seemed to keep him in a good mood instead of a foul one. Emily dragged him out onto the dance floor twice. When Joseph returned to Trudy the second time, he held his hand out to her. May I have this dance? Trudy's heart fluttered, feeling as if she was being courted for the first time in her life. She'd never attended a dance before their journey, other than attending as a maid taking care of food and drinks. Now she was actually going to dance for the first time in her life. I've never danced before, she said softly. He smiled. I have. Just follow my lead. With her hand in his, he led her to where the other dancers were, carefully sidestepping Bob and Mary, who made quite a spectacle of themselves. When Joseph took her into his arms, Trudy felt shivers all over her body. Being held by him, by any man, felt strange. It was certainly different than being touched by Mr. Baldwin she reveled in the feel of Joseph's arms around her and she had no desire to push him away. When he pulled her closer to avoid being trampled by Edna Blue, she expected him to immediately release her, but he never did. Instead, he held her close until the dance was over, and then he walked back to where they'd been sitting together. That was really nice, Trudy said softly. Thank you for asking me to dance with you. She'd been surprised, but it had been a good thing. Perhaps having a man's arms around her wasn't as horrible as she thought. He smiled at her. I enjoyed it as well. We'll have to do it more often. I'd like that. She wanted to ask him if he'd danced with Emily's mother often, but she had to obey their strict, no questions, policy. I want to thank you for the stories you tell Emily at night. I've never heard anything like them. He sat down beside her giving her his full attention, which never seemed to happen. She smiled. My mother always told me adventures about Gertrude. I thought Emily would enjoy it if I made her the heroine of her bedtime stories. Gertrude, he asked. Is that your full name? Trudy's eyes widened. It is, but I'd prefer you not use it. She looked around as if someone would have heard her first name, a name held by thousands of other women, and know she was a murderess. His eyes seemed full of understanding. I will never use it again. Thank you, she said softly. But I do like knowing your real name. He wanted to know everything about her now, and he hated that he'd made that silly agreement with her to never ask her questions about his past. He felt more drawn to her every day, though he was fighting the feelings. 
How could he have forgotten about his first wife for long enough to even find another woman attractive? She hadn't been dead for a full two months yet. Just make sure to think of me as Trudy so my real name isn't used. Trudy is what me ma'am called me when I was a girl, and I prefer to be called by it now. It reminds me of her. And it was a different name than anyone back east would remember her by. Is she still alive? Joseph asked, hoping the question wouldn't feel too intrusive to her. Trudy considered for a moment before responding. She's not. She died a few years back. She was run over by a carriage when she was trying to cross the street. She was knocked down and one of the horses stomped on her head. I'm so sorry for your loss. Trudy nodded. Thank you. It's been a long time, but I still miss her every day. She shook her head. And your parents? Do they live? They do. They are still in Virginia, wishing I didn't have wandering feet. And you can't blame them for that. You took their granddaughter from them. I did. My mother begged me not to come. The subject was getting too close to his late wife for his comfort, so he immediately switched topics. Have you thought more about whether you want to have a cafe or a boarding house? The more I think about it, the more the boarding house idea is growing on me. Margaret Pruitt plans to open a diner wherever the company settles and asked me if I'd like to do a combination boarding house and diner. We would manage them together. I like that idea actually. Were you planning on settling near the rest? Not until she suggested that. I hadn't thought about it before that really, she lied. She'd thought about it a lot, but since she knew she'd be changing her name, she hadn't truly considered doing it. If you'd like to settle with the others in the company, I would be open to that. I just need some open land to ranch. I think, well, I think I would like that if you would. We know everyone and feel safe with them. How would you feel? He shrugged. I'd like that you and Emily would have friends, and we'd be near a doctor. Truly, it seems like a good idea to me. Then we should do just that. I like the idea of having friends there already. I'm sure everyone is looking for the right place as we go along. I believe we're already in Oregon Territory and now we just need to find the right place to settle. What kind of place sounds good to you? He asked. I want to be away from cities, of course. Growing up in a city, it's always been my dream to live in the country, surrounded by trees and mountains. Maybe having a creek or a lake nearby, but I don't want to live on the lake. I want any children to be safe. Children? He asked. Are you thinking about having more children? She shrugged. I wouldn't be disappointed if it happened. I've always loved children, and Emily has reminded me how very much I want some of my own. She felt daring mentioning it to him, but it was the truth. Do you want to have a real marriage with me then? Joseph wasn't sure how he felt about the idea, but he couldn't deny his attraction to her. I don't think either of us are quite ready for that. She couldn't imagine being held down the way Mr. Baldwin had held her down. No, she definitely wasn't ready for a real marriage yet. Someday, but not today. How would you feel if I courted you then? I know we'd be doing everything backward, but I'd love to take you for walks in the evening and sit with you and get to know you better. Trudy bit her lip thinking about it. But you won't do anything to me without my permission, right? You won't, hurt me? His eyes widened, and he took her hand, pulling her to her feet and away from the dancing and music. Has someone raped you, Trudy? She shook her head. No, but someone tried. And I killed him. He stared at her, shocked by her words. And that's what you're running from? She nodded. I didn't want to kill him, but I pushed him away from me and he tumbled over a banister. And he died. And I changed my name and ran as far as I could. So now you know the truth. You're married to a thief and a murderess. A thief? 
Joseph was still trying to wrap his head around everything she was saying. The sweet gentlewoman in front of him had killed a man? How was that even possible? I went into his bedroom and stole three pieces of his wife's jewelry. It paid for me to get out of the city and get everything I needed for the trip to Oregon. She combed her fingers through her hair in despair. He must hate her now. How could he not? I didn't mean to kill him, but I did mean to steal the jewelry, to get away. I didn't know what else to do. I'm not sure what I should say. I'm not either, but now you know everything I've been hiding. The man I killed was my employer, and he'd raped several of the maids who worked for him. One was pregnant with his child, but was sent away by his wife, who had no idea her husband was the baby's father. Trudy took a deep breath. I would never have killed him deliberately, but I couldn't let him do that to me. He frightened me so. I'm sure he did. I had no idea. And he had no idea how he was supposed to react now that he knew his daughter was sleeping in a tent every night with a woman who had killed a man. Can we talk about this again tomorrow? Perhaps we can go for a walk after church? She nodded. I'm sure Margaret would be happy to keep an eye on Emily while we talked. She looked away from him, watching Edna weave in and out of the people on the dance floor, with her arms spread wide. How she avoided bumping into everyone, Trudy would never know. I know I should have told you all this before I married you. But I'm telling you now. We can't have a real marriage with this between us. No, we can't. And you need to know something as well. He took a ragged breath. I killed my wife. Asterisk. Trudy's dreams were worse than ever that night. But this time after she pushed Mr. Baldwin over the balcony, Joseph was there, pointing at her, and calling her a murderess. Then, he was wearing a policeman's hat and when Mr. Baldwin grabbed her ankle from the floor and pulled her down with him, he held up handcuffs and laughed at her. She woke up well before dawn, the nightmares fresh in her mind, and she got up and started a fire. There was no need to lie there in the dark, tormented by her thoughts. It was easier to be moving around and concentrating on things that must be done. Trudy wasn't surprised when Joseph joined her at the fire she built. I've been thinking about everything you told me last night, he said softly. I understand what happened. You do? She asked, surprised. I thought you'd tell me you never wanted to speak to me again once we reached Oregon City. What about what I told you? He asked. It didn't make sense. We all know your wife died of cholera. Trudy waited for him to tell her what he'd meant by his startling statement. I forced her to go to Oregon. She begged me not to make her go. She cried and cried, telling me she couldn't live without being close to her parents. The idea of going through Indian country frightened her so much. But I didn't listen. I had itchy feet, and I felt the need to leave everything we knew and set out on an adventure. In Virginia, I never would have been more than the son of a dirt farmer, but in the West, I can be anything. I wanted to give her the world, and instead, I dragged her to her death, leaving Emily without a mother. You can't blame yourself for her death. Half the men in this company forced their women to go West. How can you blame yourself for what happened? Trudy couldn't believe he likened taking his wife West with her killing her former employer. The two acts were very different. I see my action as being much worse than yours, he said softly. I did something terrible to someone I love. You were protecting yourself. So, you think you can court me and potentially have a real marriage, even though you know my past? It was hard to believe he was willing to even try with her. If you can do the same with me. Joseph didn't understand why she was surprised. She hadn't deliberately killed a man. His actions were worse than hers. In his eyes anyway. I can. I don't think you did anything wrong. And I don't think you did. She took a deep breath. I will ask that you'll still be circumspect about what I've said. 
I don't want anyone to know. She didn't want to think the people she was becoming friends with would look at her differently. I won't tell a soul. He hid his yawn behind his hand. Why are you up so early? She sighed. I have nightmares. I still see the man I killed falling over the banister, to his death. I didn't want to wake Emily, so I got up instead. That makes sense. He watched her mix some things together. Spoiling her with Johnny Cakes again? Johnny Cakes, bacon, and tea. I wish she could drink coffee, but she's doing well with the tea as long as I add a good amount of honey. She'll eat or drink anything if it has enough honey on it. He leaned back on his hands, watching her cook. He was surprised by how pretty she was. He hadn't really looked at her the way he was now. Sure, he'd noticed that he was physically attracted to her, but he was certain that was just their proximity to one another. Knowing she was pretty, well, he wished he hadn't noticed. He might have to court her for a good long while before he could bet her. Emily woke up excitedly when she saw the breakfast Trudy was making. Sunday is the only day you can sleep late, Trudy told the girl. I would think you'd take advantage of it. Emily shook her head. Sunday is the only day when I get to play all day long. Trudy hid a grin, but Joseph shook his head. You can help Trudy with the wash today. The wash? Emily frowned. I don't like washing clothes. I'm sure Trudy doesn't either. Joseph gave the girl a stern look. Yes, Papa. But I don't have to like it. No, you don't. Joseph shook his head at her. I'm going to have to get one of the oxen reshed today, and that will take a while. And then I have watch duty during church. Do you know if the former captain is on his feet yet? Trudy asked, thinking about her promise to Mrs. Gabriel to sit with him again if he wasn't healed this week. I saw him walking around earlier. He's supposed to be alternating riding sitting up this week with walking. I can just imagine how he'll react to walking with the women. I'm sure he'll be at church service then. I'll be able to go with Emily. Trudy wasn't certain if she was happy or sad about that. She still felt as if God had forsaken her with Mr. Baldwin, but she knew she needed to get back to church to slowly build her faith again. She hadn't regularly attended church since before she'd left New York. Good. I'll be back for lunch, but that's probably the only time you'll see me before supper. And I'd like it if you'd ask Mrs. Pruitt to watch Emily after supper this evening. I wish to take my wife for a walk. Trudy looked down at her food, trying to keep him from seeing her blush. She wasn't used to a man courting her, and it felt strange to allow it to happen. The morning wash went quickly with the chattering that went with it. There was only a small creek to wash clothes in, instead of the river. But it was the last time they may be able to wash clothes for weeks, so they had to take advantage. Now that they were no longer traveling along the river, water would be more scarce. During the church service, Emily sat close to Trudy, and Trudy kept her arm around the little girl, who ended up falling asleep against Trudy. Trudy tried to listen to the sermon, but her mind was on the walk she'd take with her husband that evening. They'd been married a week, but had only shared one kiss and one dance. Perhaps after their walk, it would all be different. After spending some time talking to the other women after the service, Trudy walked back to her camp until she heard a shotgun. Someone was trying to get some meat. When Mary came back to camp with Bob, beside her, between the two of them, they carried a dough that was immediately strung up in a tree. There would be fresh meat that night, if there was enough for Trudy's family, and she hoped there would be. It was so much easier to cook tasty dishes with fresh meat than with dried and she did her best never to get out the beans, which Emily hated so much, but they were filling and lasted longer than most of their supplies, so she didn't have a lot of choice when there was no fresh meat. Sure enough, Mary offered to share, and Trudy was given enough meat to cook supper and have a little leftover for their noon meal the next day. 
Trudy thanked the other woman profusely. Mary shook her head. You just have to remember who fed you on the trail when I'm asking you to cook for me when we settle. Trudy smiled and nodded. I'd be delighted to give you a free meal from time to time, as that's what you're doing for us. And maybe I could be your official provider of meat for the boarding house. That's a wonderful idea. If you can provide fresh game, I'm sure we can get fresh beef from Joseph. He plans to be a rancher. Bob's still trying to decide between farming and ranching. Whichever he decides on, I'm sure he'll be happy to provide you with fresh something. Trudy smiled. That's the plan then. As she walked back toward her fire, she realized she was truly making friends now, and if God was good, they would be friends who would last a lifetime. Chapter 7 Sunday, June 21, SUP ST SUP, 1852 I walked with Joseph this evening, and it was lovely. He held my hand and picked flowers for me. It seems as if he can look past what I've done and still want to have a real marriage with me. With my history and his wife's recent death, we are moving slowly. Emily needs to have us together for a long time, and that's what we will attempt to do. I am thankful that God put Emily and Joseph into my life because they've taught me that no matter what, I can continue on with my life. One day at a time. One step at a time. We will get where we're going when we arrive there. I'm not known for my patience, but that is just fine. Together, we will reach our destination in our own time. Their walk after supper that night was different than the ones they'd gone on before. For one thing, Joseph held Trudy's hand as they walked. It felt a great deal more intimate to her than just walking side by side. And he stopped to pick her some flowers that grew alongside the trail. She wasn't sure if they were truly flowers or weeds, but they smelled nice and looked pretty, and that was all that really mattered. He talked a little about his wife, Alice, and Trudy listened quietly. She wasn't about to ask questions when they'd both made it clear that questions weren't acceptable. She was a shy thing. I met her at the store in town one day, and when I tried to talk to her, she blushed and went over to stand beside her mother. I think she may have been too young to be ready to marry, but her parents really encouraged her to accept me as her husband. She was only 16, and I was 19 at the time. That is young. At 16, Trudy had still been an apprentice cook under her mother. She couldn't imagine marrying so young. I probably should have waited, but I was ready to start my life as a married man. We had Emily right off which probably wasn't great for her either. After the baby was born, she had no desire to ever leave the house without me. I had to take time off from working my father's land with him just to take her to the store in town for the supplies we needed. He shook his head. When I first brought up going west, she got me to agree to wait a year. And then another year. She kept saying Emily was too small to make the trek. And then she finally admitted that she didn't want to live so far from her parents. Her mother visited with her almost every day. I think if her mother hadn't been there to talk to her, she'd have ventured out more and learned to stand on her own two feet. I can see that. When I started cooking for a different family than my mother did, I visited with my mother every Sunday morning. And then after she died, well, I felt like I had to be an adult and on my own. I already was, but I knew I had my mother to lean on if I ever needed to. Trudy shrugged. It was better once I was completely on my own, though, because I took responsibility for my own actions. How long did you work for the family you were working for before you left for the trail, he asked. He tried to avoid mentioning the horrible thing that had happened, but he still wanted to know the answer. Three years. I started working for them when I was 18. So, you're 21 now? She nodded. I am. I'm 25 now. It's hard to believe you're younger than my first wife. You seem so much more, sure of yourself. Joseph was impressed with the woman who stood beside him. 
She was strong and seemed ready to face the world in a way Emily's mother had never been. I was a different person six months ago. Having to run from people and constantly hide makes you competent quickly. You have no choice in the matter. That makes a lot of sense to me. I do wish I'd courted Emily's mother for a couple of years before I actually married her. Perhaps everything would have been different then. Joseph seemed to think he'd made a big mistake. You know, looking back makes it easy to know what to do. I'm sure you did what you thought was best at the time. I did. He sighed. And I wouldn't have Emily if I'd done things differently. I don't know what I'd do without Emily. Trudy smiled. She's such a special little girl. I've never known anyone like her. She's so full of life. That's a good way to put it, Joseph said with a smile. She spent so much time in our tiny little house with her mother back east that she's excited to be outside, doing what she wants to do and having other children to do it with. She honestly loves being on the trail, as long as she doesn't have to eat beans. Well, she'll be eating beans as we continue on. There's no avoiding them. Hopefully there will be some good hunting along the way, though. There will. I wish I had the time to hunt as I'd like, but usually by the time we've stopped for the day, all I can really do is see to the animals and take my turn at watch duty. I know. Mary's a good hunter, and she usually gets enough for several families. And Trudy was thrilled that her family was now on the list of people who benefited from Mary's hunting skills. They stopped and looked out over the creek where Trudy and the other women had washed clothes that morning. Joseph turned to Trudy after a short while. May I kiss you? Trudy's heart started beating faster, just thinking about it. He'd only kissed her as part of their wedding ceremony, and the idea of kissing him now, well, it both frightened and excited her. I'd like that. Joseph was careful not to trap her in his arms, and instead, put his hands lightly on her shoulders. He leaned down and very gently brushed his lips against hers. When she didn't shy away, he tilted his head to one side and deepened the kiss, his tongue tracing her lips, before he lifted his head. Are you all right? Trudy felt a little dazed, and she swayed on her feet a bit. Lovely. He chuckled. I won't be afraid to do that again then. Why would you be afraid? After what you went through with Mr. Baldwin, I worry that I'll frighten you by kissing you. I don't want to do anything that will make things harder for you. I appreciate that. You're my wife. It's my duty to protect you from things that frighten you, not become something to fear. Trudy smiled. Thank you for feeling that way. I'm sure a lot of men wouldn't mind a whole lot if their wife was afraid. I do. I want everything to be comfortable for you. Joseph paused for a moment. How do you feel about the possibility of a real marriage now? As long as you don't mind taking it slowly, I'm all for it. I think it would be good for me, and I know it would be good for Emily. Trudy wasn't sure if she was really ready to be married to the man for the rest of her life, but she certainly enjoyed his kisses. That had to be a good sign. Then we'll keep trying to court whenever we have a chance. Do you want to walk again tomorrow evening? She chuckled. I'll let you know what I feel up to tomorrow. Walking twenty miles per day makes my legs feel like leaves in the fall. They're going to crack with even a little bit of pressure. I haven't heard any of the other women complain, and I'm not going to be the first, but they do hurt. He laughed. I think I can understand that. And I like the idea of taking things slowly. It's going to take me a little while to feel like I can handle love again. She nodded. I do understand that. I'm really surprised at how quickly Emily has warmed up to me. I hope she stays that way and doesn't get too surly as she gets older. It's not in her nature to be surly. She's such a good-natured girl. You think that because you didn't know her when she was a colicky baby. She had us up all night every night. 
your wife didn't tend her? Of course, she did, Joseph said. But she cried loudly enough that I heard every single whimper. Trudy smiled. I'm sure she was a delightful baby, even if she was colicky. She was. I'm so pleased with your relationship with Emily. The stories you tell her every night make her very happy. I hope you know that. I try to make her happy. And I'm teaching her to cook as we go. We had a cook stove back in Virginia, he said. My wife couldn't learn to cook over an open fire for anything. She burned so many things she tried to make. Trudy shrugged. I burned a few meals when I first started trying but I firmly believe if you are a good cook over a stove, you'll also be a good cook over a campfire. You learn to adjust. Emily and I are very thankful your mother took the time to teach you as well as she did. Joseph was certainly eating better now that Trudy was the family's cook. I am too, to be honest. I was a cook back east for a few years, but first I worked under her. I only went to school until I was ten because my mother wanted to ensure I was ready to take on a job as a cook. She gave me the best start she knew how. They had reached the edge of camp again, and she sighed, sorry that their day of rest was over. I'll go get Emily from Margaret, and we'll head back to our wagon. And I'll go get the livestock fed and take them down to the water. This is the part of our journey where we really need to ration water. Our rain barrel is full. We'll have to keep putting it out to catch the rain any time it comes along. But they'd been doing that the entire way. It would have to be enough. He nodded. I'd rather not use our water rations for the oxen, but if we need to, we will. Definitely. I don't want to think about how dirty we'll be before we get to Oregon City. I hope there are some good lakes and rivers along the way. There are. The maps I've seen show many rivers and creeks and lakes, but they're going to be a lot more spread out now. We've spoiled ourselves by traveling along the Platte River for so long. My legs do not currently feel spoiled, she said, stifling a groan. Walking with him had been lovely, but painful as well. He laughed. You'll get there. Your legs will be used to it soon, and you'll wonder why they ever hurt to begin with. I've never heard any of the women complain about this journey, except maybe Mrs. Mitchell. She calls it a death march. Trudy found herself having a hard time when she walked in a group with Mrs. Mitchell. But all of her children are safe, and there are a lot of them. I just pray it stays that way all the way to our destination. I feel as if we've lost so many. She'd not been close to any of the people who had died but she'd felt every death, just as well. It was difficult knowing you were on a journey where many would not survive. He nodded. I do too. Too many. He looked sad for a moment, but then he started off in the direction of the livestock. Every night the men chose where they would keep the livestock for the night. They consoled themselves by realizing the manure left by their oxen would fuel fires later in the summer. Trudy headed to Margaret's wagon to fetch Emily, who was still playing with the other woman's girls. Thank you for being willing to keep an eye on Emily for me. We're going to try to take regular walks. I think you should. Margaret said. Jamie and I are an old married couple now, but we took our turn taking long walks. It's always best to tuck a blanket under your arm as you walk. Trudy shook her head. Whatever for? It makes a dalliance a bit easier, Margaret said, winking at her friend. Trudy blushed. I, I'll keep that in mind. As she headed back to her own campfire with Emily's hand in hers, the little girl talked about everything she'd done with her friends, which had included making butterflies out of prairie grass. It sounds like you had a wonderful time. Emily nodded. I love to play with Annie, Amanda, and Sally. They're my best friends in the whole wide world, and I'll be sad when we reach Oregon and never get to see them again. Is Oregon big? Could we visit? Trudy smiled. 
we're planning on settling as a community. Most of the people on the wagon train will live close to us. She was thrilled to be able to tell the girl of their future plans, because she knew Emily would be happy with them. Emily let out a little squeal of excitement. Do you mean it? I do. I've already talked to your papa about it. I'm so happy. We will always be friends, and we will be able to go to the same school and visit. When we get to Oregon, will we still be able to go outside and see people? Or will we have to be in the house all the time to be safe? Emily asked. Thanks to the discussion she'd had with Joseph on their walk, Trudy understood the question. There will be dangers in Oregon, but there are dangers everywhere. We will be able to spend time with our friends whenever we would like. I'm even going to be working with Mrs. Pruitt. You will? Yes. The two of us plan to open a boarding house with a restaurant. Then people who pass through town will have a place to eat and sleep. And people who live in town can eat there whenever they want to. And I'll go to school? Emily asked. I'm not sure if we have a school teacher in our group, but I'm certain even if we don't, we can find someone. Do you want to go to school? Emily nodded emphatically. I wasn't old enough before we left, and I don't think Mama would have let me go anyway. She was scared. What was she afraid of? Trudy asked. Emily's mother seemed a little odder every time she was mentioned. Emily shrugged. She thought I'd be hurt if I went outside. And she only left when Papa was there. Trudy sighed. Well, I'm not afraid of much. We'll make sure you go to school and get to play outside lots. I'd like that. Emily ran ahead to the fire that was slowly going out. I'm glad you're my new mama. You are? Trudy smiled. Why is that? Because you care about me, just like I care about you. And you're not scared to go outside and will let me play with my friends. In the winter, you'll have to play indoors more than out, but yes. You can always play outside. Her story for Emily that night was about four little girls who were the best of friends and the wonderful times they had playing inside during the winter. She hoped that Emily would realize it was always all right for her to have friends to come and play. Once again, Joseph stood outside the tent and listened, thinking about how wonderful it was that he'd found someone who truly cared about Emily to be her stepmother. He only hoped things would always be as good as they were right then. Asterisk. Emily fell and twisted her ankle the following morning, right after they began their day's walk. Trudy felt around the ankle, but only felt bruising. She finally picked the girl up and put her in the back of the wagon. Would you like me to ride with you? She asked, thankful that the wagons moved so slowly it was easy to keep up on foot. Emily wiped a tear from her eye. I want my mama. Trudy closed her eyes for a moment, wishing with all her heart she could make the girl's mother magically appear for her. I can't do that, but I can ask your papa to come back and sit with you. Emily shook her head. No. Trudy hurried to the front of the wagon and climbed on beside Joseph. It was a little tricky to hold her skirt in one hand and pull herself up into the moving wagon, but she managed. Emily fell and hurt her ankle. She's crying for her mama. Joseph frowned. Where is she now? In the back of the wagon, still crying. I asked her if she wanted you to come sit with her, because I can drive, of course, but she said she only wanted her mama. I do think you should speak with her. He immediately handed her the leads. I'll do that. Trudy took the leads, saying a silent prayer that Joseph would be able to get through to Emily. He knew the girl was hurting, but it would be good for her to have her father beside her. Joseph was back on the seat beside her less than ten minutes later. It was so much easier to get down and walk than it was to try to climb through all their belongings in the back of the wagon, so that's what he'd done as well. She wants you to sit with her now. What did you say to her? 
Trudy didn't want Joseph trying to coerce Emily into wanting her. It had been hard to see the child cry for her mother, but Trudy knew she would have been just the same if she'd lost her mother at such a young age. It was hard enough to lose her when she was an adult. I just told her that the reason she has a new mother is for times like this. We'll have the doctor look at her ankle at our noon break, but I think you're right. It's not broken. Trudy nodded. All right. I'll go and sit with her then. Thank you. He squeezed her hand as he took the leads back from her, and she got down from the wagon to go and see to their daughter. Chapter 8 Tuesday, June 23, SUP RD, slash SUP, 1852 Emily is getting surly. Her ankle has been sprained and she's not happy having to ride in the wagon. She wants to be walking with her friends. I had no idea she could be as downright crabby as she's been yesterday and today. I do hope this doesn't continue for long. I know it's hard on her, and I'm doing everything I can to make it more palatable. Hopefully she realizes soon that she doesn't have to be miserable just because she's injured. She's making a choice. Emily spent the rest of the day in the back of the wagon. Margaret loaned Trudy a children's storybook and she sat in the back of the wagon with Emily, reading to her. It was a good way to spend the day, but Trudy was sore from the bumps along the trail by the end of the day. As she cooked supper, Emily sat on the ground beside Trudy, looking terribly dejected until Sally and Amanda came over and sat down with her, telling her everything she'd missed that day. We wanted you to walk with us, Amanda said, frowning. My new mama read me stories in the back of the wagon. I hope I can walk tomorrow. Emily looked positively dejected about having to stay in the back of the wagon. She was not a girl who enjoyed sitting still. Did the doctor have to look at it? Trudy answered that for the girl. The doctor was too busy with some sick people to look at it earlier, but he promised to come by before supper tonight and make sure it's not broken. Does it hurt to talk? Sally asked. At three, she was not as sure about most things as her sister and friends. Emily shook her head. Just to walk. Trudy carried me and put me in the wagon, and Papa got me out. Dr. Bentley came by then with Betty at his side. Now let's look at this ankle. He squatted down beside his young patient. Which one is it? he asked. Emily patted her right leg. Well, let's see what we can see. Did you like riding in the wagon today? I wanted to walk with my friends, but I couldn't. The doctor carefully examined the ankle. There's a bit of swelling and bruising, but I think it's just sprained. Is it okay if I wrap something around it so you'll be able to walk some of the day tomorrow? Emily nodded. I would like that. Can I walk all day? Dr. Bentley shook his head. No, I think you should pick the morning or afternoon, and if it starts hurting, you need to let your new mama know about it. Emily sighed, obviously not happy with his answer. But if I wake up, and it doesn't hurt? Then you should choose to walk in the morning and not in the afternoon. He finished wrapping her ankle in a long piece of cloth he had with him. Is it all right if I send Annie over to play with you girls? She talked to me about how much she missed being able to spend the day with you. I'd like that. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. The doctor got to his feet and looked over at his wife, who was talking animatedly with Trudy. Are you staying here? Or do you want to go see the other patients with me? I'm going to stay and talk to Trudy. I can learn a lot from watching her cook, Betty answered. I'm not sure how much you'll learn from the way I cook venison, but I'm happy to allow you to watch. It's nice to have company on occasion. I think it's always nice to have company, Betty said. I used to hide in the back of our wagon and read, and never get out and even talk to anyone. I'd talk to my sister and no one else. Margaret talked me into spending time with others on the trail, but it wasn't easy for me at first. I like Margaret a lot, and I think you know, 
I'm just learning to talk to people with us as well. It was easier for me to drive and ignore the other women, but if I want to feel like I'm part of the company, then I need to act like it. Trudy smiled. And Margaret and I have decided to go into business together once we reach our destination. I used to think of it as reaching Oregon, but we're already in Oregon, and we're nowhere close to our final destination. No, I suppose we're not. Betty shook her head. I think in my head we were going to walk for two weeks and be there. Instead, we've been on this trail for over two months, and we're not even close. Do you know if everyone is planning on resting in Oregon City once we get there and spending the winter? Trudy asked. I've read that's what a lot of folks do, rather than risk the storms that come. I don't think so. That's why this company was so eager to move out, even though we knew there would be little fresh grass for the beginning of the journey. The oxen made it through that, though, and now they have beautiful grass to graze on. I think we're only a day or two behind the only company in front of us. Trudy nodded. It does seem that we should have passed them by now, with as consistent as we've been about moving so much every day. The thing with the former captain slowed us way down, but I think we're all glad to see he wasn't the heartless coward we assumed him to be. Heartless coward. I like that. Betty grinned at Trudy. He's giving poor Mrs. Gabriel a run for her money. She feels like she needs to care for him because he was hurt saving her daughter. I spelled her one afternoon, and I swear she should be nominated for sainthood. Trudy took the meat off the fire and quickly mixed together a gravy in the drippings from the meat. I agree. Betty carefully watched Trudy. I've never seen anyone mix the water and flour in another bowl before adding it. My mother always mixed flour with the drippings. I do that some too, but I like the way it turns out this way a little better. Trudy shrugged. My mother taught me the way your mother taught you. I just experimented with different ways, and this seems to work best for me. Maybe I'll do some experimenting as well. Betty smiled. I like to learn new things. I do as well. I'll make a cake with some of the dried fruit we have for dessert to help cheer Emily up. She is not a fan of having to ride in the back of the wagon. Trudy looked over at the girl who was now smiling with her friends. Emily couldn't be horribly hurt with as happy as she looked at that moment, which was a relief to Trudy. Betty left as soon as she'd watched Trudy whip up her dessert, committing what Trudy put in it to memory. I'll try it as well. It's hard to keep my family happy with the meals I have available to cook. Trudy sighed. Cooking is an art form, and like any other, if you don't have the best tools at hand, it's more difficult, but it can still be done and done well. As Betty walked away Trudy carefully put the cake on to bake. She knew it would make Emily happy, and she truly hoped it would please Joseph, which was odd to her, because she had never cared about pleasing him, but suddenly she did. She was taking better care with her appearance as well, as best she could, wanting to please him physically. As soon as he walked into camp, she served their plates, sending the little girls back to their families so they could eat as well. Is this the last of the venison? Joseph asked. I may take my rifle on our walk tonight. It would be nice if I could be the one supplying meat to others for a change. I think that's a wonderful idea. But then Trudy's eyes went to Emily. I'll need to stay here, though. Emily can't really play with her friend. Nonsense, he said. She'll go to Mrs. Pruitt's and play with her girls as she's been doing. They'll just have to play differently like they were here tonight. I'm sure that would be fine if Emily wouldn't mind. Emily? Trudy asked. Emily nodded, excitement filling her face. I'd like that very much. I'll carry you over after I do the dishes then, Trudy said. With all the carrying of the child she'd done that day, Trudy was thankful for her time driving. Her arms were much stronger than they'd been just months before. After supper, Joseph found his rifle, while Trudy carried Emily to Margaret's wagon. 
Do you mind watching her again? I know you said yesterday you didn't mind, but today she's injured. Margaret shook her head. Of course, I don't mind. I have a game in mind to teach the girls that will allow them to sit and play instead of running around like heathens. Trudy laughed. They do rather seem like heathens at times, don't they? Joseph walked up behind her then. Who seems like heathens? The little girls who run around with Emily. They are wild little things when they get to playing, Margaret said. Including my own two girls, of course. Of course, Joseph said with a smile. Well, I hope they all have fun sitting quietly tonight. I'll make sure of it, Margaret said. And when we get back, the cake will have cooled enough to eat, Trudy said with a smile. That will be nice, Emily said. Now go so I can play with my friends. Joseph nodded. Yes, ma'am. As they walked away, Joseph slung the gun over one shoulder, but he still held Trudy's hand. I'm sorry I let her get hurt today, Trudy said. I felt badly about it all day. Why would you feel badly? She runs around like a heathen. You and Margaret were right about that. I know, but I've only been a mother for a week, and here I am, injuring the child I've been given to protect from harm. Joseph shook his head. You didn't injure her. She injured herself by acting like a wild child. Trudy felt a corner of her mouth lift up. You're truly not angry with me about it? Not at all. If you'd pushed her or hit her and injured her, it would be different, but you were completely innocent. Joseph hated that she even felt like she needed to apologize for the girl getting hurt. So how was your day in the back of the wagon? She sighed. Long. And Emily was so miserable. I hate that she had to sit there the whole day. I read to her, but she kept trying to see what her friends were doing outside and she couldn't even concentrate on what I was saying. The doctor said it's not broken, and he wants her to ride half the day tomorrow. I'm glad sitting with her isn't my duty. He shook his head. I love my daughter, but she's perfectly dreadful when she can't do what she wants to do. She's a very sweet girl, Trudy said. But she was difficult today. She wanted to be down running with her friends. And I'm sure she told you that over and over. She did. I was just glad that after you talked to her, she quit asking for her mama. I felt so bad when she was doing that. I know I can substitute in many things, but wanting to be held by your real mother when you're injured is just not one of those things. It'll be different soon. She does love you, and she'll get used to the idea of going to you when something happens. It's perfectly natural. Trudy nodded. I do hope you're right. Shoo, Joseph stopped walking and dropped her hand, bringing his rifle to his shoulder. With two shots, he brought down two deer. When they were sure there weren't any more, he smiled at her. Run to camp and get me some help toting these back. We'll be able to share the meat with others this time. I'm on my way. Trudy hurried back though she didn't full out run. The first person she encountered was Mr. Pruitt, and she said, Joseph just brought down two deer, a doe, and a buck. Can you help him bring them back to camp? We'll happily share the meat. I'd be happy to help. That way, he pointed in the direction she'd come from, and when she nodded, he took off at a run. She asked two more men for help, and when they all left, she joined Margaret at her camp, noting that the girls were sitting on a blanket on the ground and three of them had their eyes closed. Emily was telling them something. Is this the new game you told me about? Trudy asked Margaret. Yes it is, but what are you doing back so soon? Margaret asked. Joseph shot two deer, and he needed help getting them back to camp. Margaret's eyes lit up. Oh, that's wonderful. You've been blessed with fresh meat. As have you. Don't think we won't share with as often as others have shared with us. I feel like we've all been blessed to be part of such a wonderful group of people. 
If you have to walk 2,000 miles, it's always good to do it with people you care for. Trudy smiled. I'm surprised anyone is considering me one of the people they care about, but I'm happy you do. Of course, I do. Soon, we'll be running a business together, and our girls will play together every day. You need to hurry up and have a baby as well. We could have more children playing together. Margaret seemed to like the idea of raising their children together. Unsure how to respond to that, Trudy changed the subject. Tell me about this game you have the girls playing. Margaret grinned. Not ready to talk about that. I remember being a newlywed for the first time. The game is simple. They take turns describing something they can see, but they can't use the name. The ones with their eyes closed have to guess what it is the person who has them open is describing. Then when someone guesses, the play moves to the next girl. I came up with it during the long hours of driving before I married Jamie. I thought it would be good to have it ready for the girls to play if one of them was sick or injured while we were on the trail. Chapter 9 Wednesday, June 24, SUP, TH, SLASH SUP, 1852 It stormed today. There was thunder, lightning, and it just poured down on us. I thought it was thrilling to watch from the back of the wagon, but little Emily was afraid. I wish I'd had the right words for her, so she'd know everything would be all right. If I were her real mother, I'm certain I would have known what to say immediately. We were only able to move half the usual distance today. The rainstorm forced us to stop. Filling our rain barrels is a priority at this point because we're no longer traveling along a river. I pray there is more rain to keep our barrels full as we continue on this journey. Joseph has told me there will be other streams and rivers along our path, but it seems so dry here. I hope he is right. Emily was hurting within an hour of starting the day, and she went to Trudy crying. I don't want to ride, but my ankle hurts again. Trudy sighed. I have an idea. I'm going to put you in the back of the wagon, but then I'm going to see if I can make a little magic happen for my enchanted princess. She hated that the little girl was hurting, but it was even worse that she felt isolated. She hoped she could easily fix that. Her face showing her pain, Emily nodded. I don't want to be hurt. I know you don't, baby. Edna walked toward them. She's not a baby, you know. I know. But she's hurt. Would some of my peppermint stick help? Trudy shook her head. She didn't know if licking the nasty thing would help or not, but she felt like Edna should keep the germs that went with her peppermint stick to herself. No, she just needs to rest her ankle. Trudy lifted Emily in her arms and carried her to the back of the wagon, setting her inside. I'll be right back. Emily wiped at the tears with the back of her arm. Hurry. I will. Trudy went to both Margaret and Betty asking a simple question. Would you mind if the girls rode in the back of the wagon with Emily? She said that she hurts too much to walk, but I think her day would be much better if the other girls joined her. Margaret's face lit up and she nodded. If that will help, then I think that's what you should do. What a good idea. Trudy gathered the three girls together, and they all climbed into the back of the wagon with Emily. Emily's face when her friends joined her was absolutely priceless. She was obviously ready to have fun with her friends. Did your mama say you could ride with me? Emily asked. Trudy nodded. All three of them will ride with you until the noon meal, and then you'll nap after. By the time your nap is over, you may be able to walk for a little while again. Oh, thank you, mama. Emily's voice was filled with excitement. She wouldn't have to ride alone. Trudy's heart felt like it swelled a dozen sizes larger at Emily's calling her mama. It just felt right. I'll check on you all in a little while. Joseph heard his daughter's exclamation and he frowned. He wasn't sure if he was ready for Emily to call Trudy mama. 
Her mother hadn't been gone for long enough to be replaced. When Trudy climbed onto the front of the wagon to talk to him, Joseph wanted to tell her to stay away from his child. Their relationship had thrilled him the day before, but today, well, today it only angered him. She couldn't claim his late wife's life, even if they were married. Emily's in the back of the wagon again, but she has three friends with her this time. Her ankle was starting to swell, and she was devastated she couldn't walk any longer. Trudy shook her head. I felt bad for her. Thank you for taking good care of my daughter. He didn't mean to place the emphasis on the word my, but it was there nonetheless. Trudy glanced at him, wondering if there was a problem she didn't know about. Instead of asking and being overheard by four little girls, she simply said, I'll return to the women. He nodded, staring straight ahead. There was something wrong between them. Trudy could feel it, but she had no idea what it could possibly be. Everything was fine that morning before they began their day's journey. Trudy jumped down, but instead of joining the women, she walked off to one side, her mind going over and over what had just happened with Joseph. His tone had been so cold, she felt like she could have frozen her hand on it. By their noon break, Trudy had come to the conclusion that he didn't want her around Emily because she was a murderess. What else could it possibly be that would make him talk to her as if she was the stranger she'd been a couple of weeks before? Now that they'd shared a real kiss, it seemed like they should just be growing closer. Penelope walked over to join Trudy. Are you all right? Trudy nodded. Yes, of course. Just needed to be alone with my thoughts for a while. Do you want to talk about whatever is bothering you? For a moment, but just a moment, Trudy considered pouring her heart out to Penelope and explaining the entire situation. But she couldn't see the hatred that would certainly be in the other woman's eyes. No one would want to be friends or start a business with a murderess, and she didn't trust anyone enough to let them know her secret. No but thank you. I think I just need to have a little time of contemplation. Penelope reached down and squeezed Trudy's hand. I'll be walking with the others if you change your mind. Trudy nodded, but she kept staring straight ahead. She hated that Joseph now realized she was a terrible person and not fit to be around his daughter, but who could blame him? Emily was a precious child, and Joseph was protecting her as any good father would. When they stopped for the noon meal, Joseph was just as cold as he'd been in the wagon that morning. He thanked her for the meal, but spoke only when he needed to speak. Trudy couldn't help but sink into silence and despair beside him. Her whole life had changed because of one awful moment months before. Never again would a man think she was fit to be a wife or a mother. Never. Trudy checked Emily's ankle before using a bit of their precious water to wash the dishes. It looks like the swelling is going down from this morning. You may walk after your nap if you feel up to it. I'll decide what my daughter can do or not do. Joseph looked at Emily's ankle. You may walk if you choose. Thanks, Papa, Emily said, looking confused. Trudy knew that what was going on between her papa and her new mother had to be confusing. She only wished there was something she could say to Emily to explain it all, but there wasn't. Nothing at all. She couldn't ever let the little girl know she was a murderess. Trudy made a huge pot of the venison cut into chunks and rice that night with a little bit of gravy to make it all moist. Emily loved it and talked about how wonderful it was for a good portion of the meal. Am I going to play with my friends while you walk? Emily asked. Trudy glanced at Joseph, who shook his head. We're not going to walk tonight. I have to check on the livestock. Emily looked confused, but she said nothing. Trudy felt his words cut through her like a knife. Why had he changed his mind about her so suddenly? It made no sense to her. No sense at all. Emily, we should make some biscuits with honey tonight. Did your mama teach you to make biscuits over a fire? Trudy was aware that Joseph got up then and stomped away from camp, 
but it made no sense to her, so she continued talking to the child. I actually prefer how biscuits taste over a campfire to cooked on a stove. The last thing she said may have been a stretch, but Trudy did like biscuits cooked over a campfire. Emily shook her head. No, when Mama tried to bake biscuits over a campfire, she always burned them. I see, Trudy said. Well, let's learn to do it tonight, since you are hurt anyway, and you can't really play with your friends. Trudy? Emily asked. Yes? What is wrong with Papa? Trudy shrugged. I'm not sure. I do hope he feels better tomorrow, though. By the time Joseph was back at camp, it was dark, and the dishes had long since been washed and the biscuits packed away for breakfast in the morning. He stood for a moment, listening for one of Trudy's bedtime stories, but he heard nothing, so he climbed under the wagon. He wished he'd done anything but marry so quickly after his dear wife's death. She would have hated knowing her daughter was calling another woman mama so soon. Asterisk. Joseph's mood was just as foul the following day as it had been. Trudy felt that she understood why he was angry with her, so she didn't ask him about it. Instead, she took care of her chores and went about her business as she normally would. She made a white gravy with pieces of bacon cut up in it for their breakfast and poured it over the biscuits. It was a filling meal, and she knew it was a welcome change from many of the things she made. It was strange that she was a well-practiced cook, but there were very few things that were available for her to make on the trail. There was some of the venison and rice left from the night before, and Trudy planned to serve that for the noon meal, but she had no idea what to do for her supper. Perhaps beans again, if no meat became available for her to use. Joseph kissed Emily on her forehead before going to hitch up the wagon, leaving Trudy to decide whether Emily's ankle would support her for walking a portion of the day. It was strange that he'd felt so strongly about making the decision the day before, but today he didn't even look at the injury. It just showed her that he didn't want her having much to do with Emily. They certainly wouldn't be able to stay married after they reached their destination, but maybe that was for the best. He knew her secret. Without him, she could easily separate from the others and open a boarding house on her own. Emily's ankle looked like the swelling was gone and the bruising around the bone was starting to fade. I think you can walk for a while today unless it starts paining you, Trudy said. I'll like that. Thank you, Trudy. Trudy was sad that the girl had only called her mama the one time, but it made sense. She'd needed friends to play with and she'd been excited. The word had obviously simply slipped out. Trudy walked with the other women again that day, but she mostly listened to their chatter, instead of actually being part of the conversation. She had to pull back and not become close to these women, knowing she wouldn't be able to stay with them. No, they knew she'd married Joseph, and she wasn't going to be able to explain why they were suddenly apart once they arrived. Emily was able to make it all morning, and when Trudy checked her ankle after the noon meal, it looked the same as it had that morning. I think you can keep walking, Trudy said softly, worried that Joseph would jump in, but he remained silent. Emily clapped her hands. I can walk all afternoon. After your nap, you can walk, Trudy corrected. That's all right. My friends nap when I do, so we'll still be able to play a lot. Enjoy yourself, because we're probably going to have beans for supper. Emily groaned. Anything but beans. Please. Trudy frowned. I can make a gravy from our jerky and serve it with potatoes and carrots if you want. Yes, please. Don't be spoiling my daughter, Joseph said harshly. She can eat beans if that's the best thing for you to cook. Trudy bit her lip. It's not really the best thing, but we'll be eating a lot of beans toward the end of our journey if we don't work them into our meals now. Then we'll have beans tonight, and Emily will be thankful she has food to eat. Joseph put his bowl down and strode from the campsite. 
Trudy watched him leave, wondering how she could make the meal more palatable for Emily without angering her husband, more than he was already angry that was. Emily sat staring after her father. Why is he angry with us? I don't know, sweetheart. I really don't. Trudy sighed. Would you like to make biscuits again tonight? I can show you how to make them and fry up a few pieces of bacon we can eat on the biscuits. Emily smiled for a moment, but then it faded. That would make Papa angry. We need to be nice to him and do as we should. Then that's what we'll do, Trudy said. But I'll make a cake for dessert, and he can't stop us from that, can he? Emily giggled. I'll help make the cake. Good. It's a plan. Trudy knew Joseph was angry with her, but she didn't like it that he was taking his anger out on the child. As she walked with the other women that afternoon, Trudy was lost in thought. For a short while, it had seemed she and Joseph were going to be able to make things work out between them. But now, now that she knew she loved him, he was drifting away quickly. She would simply have to keep her chin up, though, because things didn't seem like they were going to change. For whatever reason, Joseph was too angry with her for that. Her life had changed so much in a few short months. She'd had her life spread out in front of her, and she'd felt like she could do anything, but then after Mr. Baldwin had acted so horribly, she'd felt as if she would always be alone, looking over her shoulder. The further they'd come on the trail, the safer she had felt, and then she'd married Joseph, and little Emily had been the only light she'd needed to see her way. And then she'd begun to believe she could actually find love with a man who knew all about her past. Now, she was devastated again. She was going to have to spend the rest of her life alone. She only wished she'd never told Joseph the truth. Because it had surely pushed him away. What do you think, Trudy? Penelope asked. Trudy blinked a couple of times, pulled from her thoughts. About what? I was wool gathering, I'm afraid. The other women laughed. That's what you're supposed to do when you're a newlywed, Hannah said softly. What do you think about all of us making a big meal together on Saturday night? And then we'd eat as a group. I've heard many companies do that every night, but ours never really has. Penelope grinned, but she didn't join in the laughter of the other women. That sounds lovely, Trudy said, caring little about what would happen in three days. She was too worried about getting through that day while facing her husband's anger. Oh, good. Margaret smiled at her. Jamie had some of your cake the other night, and I thought it would be nice if you'd be willing to make a few cakes for everyone. Trudy smiled, but it felt forced. I'd enjoy that. I've been working with Emily on baking. Are we cooking for the entire camp? Margaret nodded. That's the idea. We'll make a meal for all the camp before we come together and dance and enjoy music as a group. I think it will make us all feel more united. Though now that I think about it, I wonder if Sunday afternoon might be better. It would feel like a church potluck from back home. Trudy nodded. I think Sunday would be better. I'd be happy to do my laundry the night before, so we'd all have a little more time to cook on Sunday. The women all agreed that Sunday was better. When lightning lit the sky then, they all saw the dark clouds forming. At least we're not near a river this time, Trudy said. But we're going to be awfully wet soon. I wonder if the men will stop so we can set the rain barrels out. I feel like half of my water supply is already gone, and we need that water for cooking. The wagons all seemed to stop rolling at her command. Trudy went to her wagon and half rolled and half lifted the rain barrel to the ground, prying the lid off so it could fill up with the precious water they needed for their journey. The men all unhitched the oxen and led them to a free spot. The entire camp was moving about all at once and Emily woke in the back of the wagon and looked at Trudy. What's happening? There's a rainstorm. We're going to collect the rain in our barrels. Are we camping here tonight? Emily asked, rubbing her eyes. 
I'm not certain. I haven't heard what the captains have decided about that yet. Trudy didn't mind the good washing that the rain gave her, but when the lightning grew closer, she knew she didn't want to be out in it. There was too much danger involved. Climbing into the back of the wagon with Emily, she sat shivering slightly until Emily found one of the blankets. I don't like the rain out here. It was nice at home, but we don't have a house to go into. Emily sighed. Mama was afraid of rain back home, but I was brave and took care of her. No, we don't have a house, but we can still take care of each other, Trudy said. It'll be all right. We're just going to sit and watch it rain. Would you tell me another story about Emily and her friends? Trudy laughed. I'd love to tell you another story. This story is about how true friends never forsake each other. Chapter 10 Thursday, June 25, SUP, TH, SLASH SUP, 1852. The captains decided that there was no point moving on from camp today because the mud would keep us from being able to move well anyway. Instead, we stayed in, and the men shot four buffalo that were evenly split among the different families. I feel blessed to have received both fresh and dried meat. All of the women dried the buffalo together, and we had a lovely time doing it. We lost Mr. Davies today. His horse bucked while the men were chasing the buffalo, and he was thrown off, only to be trampled by the buffalo. Mrs. Davies was a schoolteacher before their marriage, and they have no children. I hope she will be willing to settle near the rest of us and teach our children. While in camp, Joseph took an extra shift watching out and I cleaned out the wagon. I found some things that will be a blessing for our trip west. It was a nice day of respite, but we've had many of late. I worry that we won't reach our final destination until it is too late in the year to move comfortably, but that's why our company moved out so early. We wanted to avoid the snows. I pray that still happens, and we lose no one else along the way. The rain stopped by supper time, but they had all collected a good amount of water in their rain barrels. It had been a hard rain for the time it had lasted. The captains were still trying to decide if they would be able to move on the following day with the mud that would be left behind. Trudy made the beans Joseph had told her to make, but she and Emily had a cake baking on the fire as well when it was time to eat. Joseph looked at the fire and then seemed to look right through Trudy. As much as she hated it, Trudy knew that he would never forgive her for her past or her present. He found her lacking. She would have to learn to be alone again once they reached Oregon City. After the dishes were finished, Emily asked if she could play with her friends, and Joseph conceded. Trudy took some mending out of the wagon. She'd stepped on the hem of one of her dresses helping Emily, and it had torn. She was seriously considering putting a shorter temporary hem into the dress that she would take out once they had reached Oregon City. It was too hard to face the conditions of the trail with her dress dragging the ground the way it did. She wished she was brave enough to make herself a split skirt like Mary wore, but she knew it wasn't a good idea. If Joseph disapproved of her now, she could only imagine how he would feel if she ran around dressed in a split skirt. As she sat and sewed, Joseph pulled out a piece of wood and a knife, and he began painstakingly carving the wood. He didn't speak, but she didn't need him to. She already understood that he wanted nothing else to do with her for the rest of her life. She'd do all she could to take care of Emily, but she wouldn't let herself be hurt by him again. She poured herself a cup of coffee and offered him one. No, thank you, he answered, not looking at her. Looking at her made him want things he shouldn't want. His real wife, Emily's mother, lay miles and miles behind them on the trail, where the wagons had driven over her resting place to keep from being found by wolves. He couldn't be choosing another woman to love already. It wasn't right. We'll have cake before bedtime, she said softly, and then she continued her stitching. There was no reason to try to converse with a man who had no desire to even look at her. She'd really thought he could accept what she'd done, but obviously he couldn't. 
When Emily came back to camp, they had exchanged no more words. The silence felt deafening, but Trudy was too stubborn to try to talk to him. Not after the way he'd been treating her. Is it time for cake, Trudy? Mrs. Pruitt said the girls had to go to bed. And you'll be going to bed soon too, Trudy said. But yes, it's time for cake. Emily clapped her hands. I love cake. Trudy laughed. I couldn't tell. I'm so glad you told me. Together, Trudy and Emily cut three pieces of the cake and served it. Emily took the piece to her papa. I helped make it, papa. Then I'm sure it's delicious. Thank you. Joseph took a bite of the cake and smiled at his daughter. She was learning so much more from Trudy than she'd been able to learn from her mother, but just thinking about that made his heart sink. He should be loyal and true, and instead he'd fallen in love with another woman. As they ate the cake, Emily told her father about how frightened she'd been in the back of the wagon while the rain had fallen. Joseph shook his head. You were never afraid of the thunder back home. Why are you scared now? We have no house here. Just a wagon. In a house, you're safe. Emily's words were simple, and Joseph sighed. I wish I could take your fears away. Emily sighed. So do I. When they went to bed a short while later, Trudy's story for Emily was about being afraid but being courageous enough to get through her fears. Emily smiled. Were you afraid when you were a little girl? All the time, Trudy said. I lost my papa when I was much younger than you, and it was just my mama and me. We lived in her employer's house, and I was always afraid they'd make us go away. Why? Emily asked. I heard people yell at children, and I was afraid if I got too loud, they wouldn't want my mama to work there anymore. It was a silly fear. And I was afraid of thunder. Because my mama worked so much, she couldn't sit with me and talk to me during the storms. That's sad. Emily sighed. I miss my mama, but I have you now. Joseph had been about to go into the tent when he heard Emily's word. He froze, shaking his head. He'd really messed up by giving in to Emily's wishes and marrying Trudy so soon. His late wife deserved more love than she was being given. So much more. Asterisk. They had to stay over the next day because of how muddy it was, and Emily was thrilled to have a non-church day to just play with her friends. The children couldn't even pick up manure because the ground was so wet. Thankfully, they had a good supply, and they could easily find more the following days. Joseph took an extra watch that day because it was easier than spending the day with his wife, and he found himself with Mr. Hastings, who had recently married the Mitchell's oldest girl, Mary. Joseph talked little, but Bob spoke of how much he loved his wife often. It seemed an odd arrangement to Joseph because Mary was better with a gun than she was at cooking. Back at the wagon, Trudy spent the day going through everything they owned so she could pare things down. There were two flour sacks that she easily combined, and she found eggs in the barrel of cornmeal Joseph had brought. She'd heard of packing eggs that way and them staying fresh the entire way, but she hadn't heard it until they were already on their journey. She would make good use of the eggs she'd found. As she was finishing, she found a journal. She was certain it was a recording of the journey, but it hadn't been made by her, so she didn't feel as if it was her right to read it. Instead, she tucked it aside and planned to give it to Joseph as soon as he returned. Shortly after the noon meal, which Joseph had missed during his time on watch, Trudy heard a great rumbling. Looking out, she saw an entire herd of buffalo running not far from camp. Everyone was on alert, and many of the men jumped on horseback with their rifles to try to get meat for the entire camp. The more they could kill as a group, the more food they would have both dried meat and fresh. The hunters were gone, and without Joseph there to protest, Trudy sent Emily out to play with her friends while she did the dishes on her own. 
There was a meal left for Joseph when he returned, but she had a feeling he was trying to shoot a buffalo as well. He was on the end of the camp where she'd seen the buffalo. A few hours later, there was much rejoicing in camp. Between them, the men had killed four buffalo. They were brought back to camp in chunks, as the horses were unable to carry the buffalo and the men. Together, the women worked on the meat for the rest of the day, drying it and each taking some for their family supper that night. Mary seemed unhappy because the men hadn't allowed her to hunt with them. If Mary's husband had been there, Trudy had no doubt that Mary would have been invited, but since it was left up to the men who were in camp, she was told to stay. Trudy was thrilled not to have to serve beans to Emily and Joseph that night, and she instead made a roast, and she made up a meat pie to cook the following night from what was left of the fresh meat. When the dishes were done and Emily was off playing with her friends, Trudy gave Joseph the journal. I'm not certain who has been writing in this, but I found it in the wagon when I was sorting through everything earlier. I thought you'd want it. Joseph stared at the object in his hand. When they'd left Virginia, his wife, Alice, had begun writing in the journal every morning. Thank you. What else could he say? He now wanted this memory of the woman he'd loved for so long. Perhaps she hadn't been as courageous as Trudy was, but she was a good wife and a very good mother. He walked away from the camp with the journal in his hand, thankful that it was still light so late in the day. It made it possible to read his first wife's words. He expected a simple journal of how far they'd gone each day, but instead he found himself reading his late wife's innermost thoughts and feelings about the journey they made. Each page was filled with so much emotion. It was the journal entry she wrote the day before they left Independence that struck his heart the most. March 28, Sup, Th, Sup, 1852. We leave Missouri tomorrow for our trek to Oregon. It will be a long, difficult journey from what I've heard and read, and I fear I will not make it the whole way. No, I say that wrong. I feel with everything inside me that I will not make it to Oregon. I love my family, and I know I will be leaving them. I pray that in twenty years I read these words I've written and see that I was wrong, but I fear it will be the opposite. Someone else will be reading these words long in the future. Perhaps it will even be my precious Emily, who has made my life worth living for so long. I do not know why I am given to so many fears and bouts of melancholy, but I do know that without Emily, I would not have survived as long as I have. I pray that Joseph will realize after my death that he must marry soon and find a new mother for my sweet daughter. With as special as she is, she cannot raise herself, and there must be a good firm hand to guide her in all things. It would be nice if that woman were able to cook, so she could teach my daughter what I cannot, but more than anything, I want Joseph to marry someone that will look upon Emily as her own daughter, and who will care for her the same way I would have. No matter what, Emily's needs must always come first. And now, I must stop writing for we leave at first light, and I will not be the one to keep the company from moving on. Though I'm certain I will not feel as if I can make friends as we go, Emily will. She is a gregarious child who is filled with love and doesn't have the kinds of fears I have. With God's grace, that will never change. Joseph read the words over and over wondering how Emily's mother had known she wouldn't survive the journey. There were other pages filled with how much she didn't want to go. How afraid she was to go. Joseph had realized she wasn't always happy, but he didn't realize that she had been so fearful or filled with melancholy. Perhaps it was meant that she didn't live longer. He took a deep breath and said a prayer that Alice would rest in peace and she would realize that her greatest wish had been fulfilled. He'd married a woman who could not only cook, but who loved Emily as much as she would have loved her own child. He closed the journal, promising himself he'd read more, but right then, he needed to talk to his new wife and explain why he'd been acting so strangely. Trudy had a right to know everything. He hurried back to camp and found his wife still sitting at the fire with his daughter. Trudy was sewing and sweet Emily was talking. 
a lot. Joseph wondered at Trudy's ability to simply sit and let Emily talk, but she never seemed to grow tired of listening to the child. Would you walk with me, Trudy? he asked. Trudy looked at him, seeming to be shocked by his words. It's almost time to put Emily to bed. Emily can put herself to bed tonight. I need to talk to you. Let me ask Mrs. Mitchell to keep an ear out for her. Trudy walked to the next wagon over where she told Mary's mother that she was going to go on a short walk with Joseph. Mrs. Mitchell simply smiled. I don't mind listening for her. I can even sit with her until she falls asleep. I think she'll be fine, Trudy said before joining her husband, who was carefully putting the journal she'd given him in the back of the wagon. He took her hand in his and led her out of the camp. I need to apologize to you, he said softly. Why? Trudy wasn't certain she understood why he was acting so differently all of a sudden. On Tuesday, I heard Emily call you mama, and it made me feel as if I'd done something wrong. I felt like we hadn't taken an appropriate amount of time to mourn Alice, and it filled me with guilt. Emily shouldn't have been calling you mama nearly so fast, and I shouldn't have been thinking about having a real marriage with you. And I certainly shouldn't have fallen in love with you. He paused and stopped walking once they were a good distance from the camp. But that journal, I read over part of it. The day before we left Independence, she made an entry into it that talked about how she was certain she wouldn't make it all the way to Oregon. She did? Trudy still wasn't sure what all this meant, and she hoped he'd tell her quickly. She wasn't an overly patient woman. And she wrote that she hoped that I would marry quickly, so Emily could grow up with a mother who loved her. He shook his head. Until reading her words, I hadn't realized that her entire life was ruled by fear and melancholy. She was desperately afraid of making this journey, but I insisted. And I always felt like it killed her. I think she simply allowed herself to die. She wouldn't drink coffee. She drank it all the time at home, but she didn't want to drink it once we were on the trail. I kept telling her that the doctor said she could keep the sickness at bay if she drank coffee instead. She said she'd lost her taste for it and only wanted to drink water. Do you think she died deliberately? she asked. I do. And I think she would be very happy to know that I married you and that you love Emily as much as you would love your own. I thought you were avoiding me because you knew I was a murderess. He shook his head. You are not a murderess. What you did was in self-defense. No one would accuse you of murdering because you never planned to do it and you have so much remorse for what happened accidentally. No, I was avoiding you because I was falling in love with you and I felt like I was betraying Alice's memory. You were falling in love with me? I was. I'm not any longer, because I am in love with you. Joseph sighed. I'm so sorry to make you feel unwanted this week, and I know that's just what I did. I felt so guilty. Now, I know that Alice would have wanted me to marry you, and my heart feels lighter. I love you, Trudy Simmons. Trudy threw her arms around him. And I love you, Joseph. So much. And Emily. I couldn't love Emily any more if she'd grown inside me. I know that. And it's why you're the new wife and mother Emily and I needed to complete our little family. Now, we'll still take things slowly as to the physical part of our marriage, but I want you to know, as soon as you're ready, I am. She smiled. I appreciate the extra time. I do love it when you touch me, and the fear hasn't come back yet, but I'm afraid it will. As I said, we'll take it as slowly as you need to. He pulled her closer and kissed her softly. Just knowing that you love me the way I love you makes it so much easier to wait. We're staying a family, whether we settle with the rest of the company or not. I do want to settle with everyone. Mrs. Pruitt and I are making business plans. He smiled. Good. I want to hear everything about them. You'll walk with me tomorrow evening? 
Trudy rested her head on his shoulder as they walked back toward camp. I will walk with you every evening for the rest of my life, 